And so is it possible that some of these creatures really are aliens that look like that? In the busy city of Houston, Texas, a very strange thing happened 13 years ago. A worried 59-year-old man walked in. His heart was giving him trouble, a big pain in his chest that just wouldn't go away. The doctors, all experts, decided to look deeper. But what they found wasn't just common heart trouble. No, this was much more unique. When they looked at this man's heart, they saw something that seemed impossible. This man, who had looked like anybody else, had a heart that was very different structurally. His heart was like a reptile's heart. The patient was found to have three chambers instead of the usual four in humans. And it was a find that made everybody surprised, a story that was not just unusual, but very strange. And it all happened right in the middle of Houston, Texas, at the famous Texas Heart Institute. A rare occurrence called atavism was suggested by puzzled scientists as a possible explanation for this unique oddity. Atavism refers to the sudden return of a feature from a far-off ancestor in a current organism, a feature that was thought to be lost in the complicated path of evolution. A leading scientist studying this case, Andrew Huberman, gave an interesting viewpoint on the possible links between human and reptile evolution. He guessed that if one traced back the beginnings of humans deep into the evolutional history, we come from water creatures, fish to be specific. Now, a fish's heart has just two chambers, a basic structure that changed as we made the big old evolution jump onto land, where we took a reptile form. A three-chambered heart structure, actually, an evolution halfway point between our water and our land-based ancestors, marked this reptile phase. Ibrahim was excited about the development of embryos and organisms, where a replay of this amazing evolution journey can be seen as the creature grows from a single cell into a complex organism. But this process has a potential risk. Any issues in development might stop the embryo at a halfway point, making its structure similar to an ancient ancestor. So, the strange heart structure of the man could be a representation of our distant reptile heritage. Can you grasp the deep truth that we're not just living in the universe, but the universe itself made of stardust? Right, as is, is weird. The cosmos, with its breathtaking beauty and endless mystery, is not something that we just watch from a distance, but it's a vital part of who we are. Our connection with the universe is not just philosophical or spiritual, but basically chemical and atomic. Yes, the self-aware beings living on a small blue dot in the huge cosmic field are made up of stardust in the truest sense. Over the ages, various research and many studies have strengthened this interesting concept. We are stardust. But to truly understand the depth of this fact, one must look into the core of how the cosmos works, studying the birth and death of stars and the heavenly dance that links all of existence. When we look through our telescopes, we see the leftover parts of star explosions, big starbursts that heat up the universe and leave behind complex nebulae. The shining gas clouds spread out in space. The Veil Nebula is one such nebula, located about 110 light years away. This leftover, the result of a massive star explosion about 8,000 years ago, shows a clear image of space disorder and uh, beauty. Pictures taken by the Hubble Space Telescope show different gases glowing in colorful lights. Oxygen shines a bright blue, hydrogen is a strong red, and sulfur colors the scene in a spooky green. So, how do these space colors relate to us? The answer is in the most personal part of our existence, our very selves, made up of elements that come from stars. The carbon that forms the basic structure of our life, the oxygen we breathe, the hydrogen and nitrogen that make up most of our body weight, and the calcium that makes our bones strong. All these elements were created inside the cosmic ovens that we call stars. Stars are like great big ovens in space, like I said, cosmic ovens, creating all sorts of things through a process called nucleosynthesis. Imagine you're a baker, you're baking a cake, and you have simple ingredients like eggs and flour. That's like hydrogen and helium that have been around since the very beginning. Since the Big Bang, the universe is eggs and flour. <laughs> That's the massive explosion that started everything. The universe's preheat button, if you will. Yay, metaphors. But as anyone who has a baked a cake knows, you need more than just eggs and flour. You need a little bit of sugar, you need some butter, maybe a splash of vanilla. In the universe's recipe, these heavier elements weren't there at the start. So where did they come from? From the stars themselves. Think of stars as super bakers, mixing and heating up those basic ingredients over and over, creating newer, heavier elements. It's kind of like a cosmic cooking show that's been going on for a couple billions of years, making all sorts of new elements for the universe's pantry. Just like us, stars have their own life story. They're born, they grow, 
and eventually they end. They burn their fuel, which is mostly hydrogen, to create a huge amount of energy. This energy pushes outwards, and it balances the inward pull of gravity. Our very own star, the Sun, is a perfect example of this. Imagine holding a balloon and constantly blowing air into it. The air that you're blowing is like the energy the star is creating, and your lips trying to squeeze the balloon is like gravity pulling inward. The star, like your balloon, maintains a careful balance to stay in its shape. But stars eventually run out of fuel. Just like you'd eventually run out of breath. When this happens, big stars end their lives with a massive explosion called a supernova. Imagine popping the balloon you're blowing into. All the air inside of it, like the rich elements inside the star, gets spread all over the place. And that's exactly how the universe gets new elements. It's a never-ending cycle of stars creating, burning, and recycling elements. Scientists call this galactic chemical evolution. A big cosmic wheel that keeps on spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. So the next time that you look up at the night sky, remember that you're not just seeing stars. You're seeing the universe's great big bakers. Hard at work, making the ingredients that make up everything we know and are and will be and <laughs> stuff. Stardust, the light leftovers of dead stars, doesn't just float around space aimlessly. It's used in the creation of new stars, recycled into the next generation of stars. The material that once powered a star's bright life now forms the basis for gas, minerals, asteroids, planets, and surprisingly, life forms like us. We owe our existence to this unending cycle of space recycling, a sign of connection of everything in the universe. Scientists look into the past to understand star life cycles and our stardust beginnings, studying space dust under strong electron microscopes. They find signs of our space heritage in old meteorites leftover pieces of the earthly solar system. Untouched by time. These meteorite pieces often contain materials like silicone carbide, graphite, and nanodiamonds, marks of a star's atmospheric oven. In the big space theory, we find our simple beginnings written. Our bodies, our world, and all that we know are the real examples of stardust formed in space ovens for billions of years. I love saying that, space ovens. So this unending cycle of star creation, burning, and recycling has given us the elements that make up our very existence, and as a result, the universe itself. We're not just watching the universe, we're a part of it. We're made of the stardust of old stars. We are indeed a way for the universe to understand itself. So we look at the universe not as separate viewers, but as aware parts of its grand and endless picture. The story of this strange event doesn't stop there. While the appearance of a reptilian heart in a human is extremely rare, it's not totally unheard of when it comes to genetic problems that seem to bring back our reptilian past. Take, for example, the proof from over a hundred medical cases going back to the 19th century, where humans were born with tails. Or think about the skin problem called ichthyosis, which leaves a person with dry, scaly skin, similar to a reptile's. Other problems like syndactyly and ectrodactyly result in fingers sticking together, or the creation of hand-like claws, respectively. As some scientists suggest, these unusual problems are strangely reptilian, and maybe more than simple reminders of an old reptilian stage in our development. Instead, they could show a deeper genetic link between humans and the mythical reptilian species. The work of neuroscientist and Stanford University professor Andrew Huberman has revealed new information supporting this theory. Huberman's study into the genetic foundations of human evolution suggests that these are not just strange happenings, but signs of an old genetic mixing, a part of our evolution story. This idea makes atavism more powerful, painting a picture of a shared family history and genetic blending that's more complex and amazing than we previously thought. As we understand genetics more and revelations like this keep happening, we're asked to rethink the complexity, the wonder of human evolution. We gotta keep an open mind to the fact that our genome may have what we call alien DNA. Which, you know, it's a little bit clickbait in the title. It's not like extraterrestrial. <laughs> it's, uh, sorry. It's just parts of our past that we don't completely understand yet. If Huberman's findings are correct, we may make our definitions of what makes us human bigger, you know? While also accepting the possibility of our evolution connection with these so-called reptilians. Could our genome contain a mix of evolution echoes waiting to be heard and understood? Only time and a more scientific exploration will answer this. The idea that humans are the result of old celestial beings is a fascinating concept, looked at by supporters of the ancient astronaut theory. They argue that confusing phenomena similar to descriptions of godlike beings from old times might be proof of alien genetic experiments. 
See, for example, the blue Mongolian spots that appear in millions of newborns worldwide. Yeah, these signs looked like the descriptions of blue-skinned gods that were in the stories of ancient India and Egypt. Moreover, there are many historical cases of gigantism, a condition strangely similar to the Nephilim. Tall beings believed to be the children of humans and a celestial race known as the Watchers, according to Bible stories. In this context, can we perhaps see these abnormalities as secret hints to a grand space story? Indeed, the DNA of every human being is a reminder of our ancestral evolution journey, a genetic record showing our relationships with creatures like reptiles and fish. Which poses an intriguing question. If extraterrestrial life does indeed have a role in shaping our genetic design, would we carry traces of their DNA within us? Surprise, not actually clickbait, duh, there's a bit of truth. I know, we're stretching it. Jason Martell, a researcher in this field, pointed out a mystery in our genetic code, the so-called junk DNA. It's a large area of our genetic landscape that remains unknown and misunderstood. Could these seemingly random genetic parts not be mistakes, but instead inactive extraterrestrial genes? Maybe these aren't just evolution leftovers, but markers brought to our planet at a certain space moment, now appearing again in our children. Supporters of the ancient astronaut theory guess that our DNA might carry inactive alien genes. If so, does going back in our family tree to the start of humans possibly reveal this celestial connection? Think about the mysterious people of the, of the Pyrenees, a mountain area on the border of Spain and France. The Busquets have been a subject of interest for historians and anthropologists for a very long time because of their special characteristics, especially their language, which is unlike any nearby languages. An especially intriguing feature of the Basque people is their unusually high number of RH negative blood types. A surprising one third of the Basque population has this rare blood type, much more than the worldwide average. But why is that interesting, right? Well, it's one of the least common blood types and the only major blood group that rarely reacts or changes because of others. Human blood types are usually sorted into four groups, which I'm sure you know, but you know, here's a reminder. O, A, B, and AB, as mentioned by the narrator. Another important factor in the system is the rhesus factor, known as the RH factor. The name rhesus comes from the rhesus macaque, an Asian monkey species that was very important in the early blood transfusion studies when standard methods for collecting blood just weren't available yet. Just like the main blood groups, the RH factor can either be positive or negative, with RH positive being the normal type in humans. But if most humans are RH positive, then why is the RH negative type so common amongst these people? Does that give us a hint about our possible alien ancestry? In the middle of this interesting mystery, we find the scientist Andrew Huberman. Known for his wide-ranging research in neuroscience, Huberman is also interested in our genetic history and our potential connections with extraterrestrials. His thoughts on the topic go along with the idea of inactive alien genes within our DNA. He suggests that if extraterrestrial beings added to our genetic code, that it's possible that certain conditions or triggers might wake up these genes, letting them show in unique ways. This goes along with the ancient astronaut theory suggesting that our DNA, including the so-called junk parts, might indeed contain inactive alien genes. In this context, could the special characteristics seen amongst the Basque people and the commonness of certain genetic traits amongst humans be proof of a distant space ancestry? But while the theory is interesting, it's important to say that there isn't any scientific proof supporting it, as of today. However, with improvements in genetic research and our ever-growing understanding of DNA, it's an area, uh, you know, ready for more study, ripe for more discoveries. Maybe the key to understanding our past and possible future is within our own genetic code, you know? waiting to be found. Across the world, a large portion of the population, about 85%, is RH positive. This means that their red blood cells have a specific antigen, the RH factor, which isn't present in the rest of the population. This group, known as RH positive, is flexible when it comes to getting blood transfusions. Whether the blood comes from an RH positive or an RH negative donor, these individuals can safely accept the transfusion with little to no bad reactions. On the other side, approximately 15% of people worldwide are RH negative. This lack of the RH factor can cause severe problems if they receive blood from an RH positive donor. If negative receives positive blood, their immune system sees it as foreign, triggering an immune response. Now that response can be deadly, as the body tries to attack and remove what it sees as foreign antigens in the RH positive blood. Even more difficult is the potential risk to RH negative women who are pregnant with the child of an RH positive man. The situation can be dangerous, especially for the baby because the mother's body might view the baby's RH-positive blood as a foreign substance. In that case, there might be a risk of the mother's immune system attacking the baby, which I shouldn't need to go into the details of why that can be problematic. 
Considering the possible danger to the child, traditionally blood tests were required before couples could officially get married, making sure the health and safety of any future children. The difficulty and seriousness of these possible problems shows the importance of understanding your blood type and how it affects your health and having children. According to researcher Nick Redfern, the situation becomes very strange when an Rh-negative mother's body might attack an Rh-positive baby in her belly, which raises a unique and deeply disturbing question. How did that happen? How did such a dangerous situation develop over time? Redfern says that it strongly suggests Rh-negatives and Rh-positives are fundamentally different, maybe going back to separate paths in our history. Research backs up the idea that there are more differences between Rh-positive and Rh-negative people. For example, studies show that Rh-negative people usually have lower blood pressure and pulse rates than average. They might even have certain physical features not commonly found in the general population. For instance, there have been recorded cases where Rh-negative people have an extra backbone, a strange event that further sets this group apart. Now, that might seem like a small detail, but it's a clear example of the small but important differences that exist among us, often hidden within our own genes. Around the world, a small number of individuals have a special feature. They are Rh-negative. For you to understand that better, we're going to go look back at our history. It wasn't until the age of exploration that began in the 15th century that this unusual characteristic started appearing in most parts of the world. Before this time, entire continents like the Americas and Southern Africa had no traces of the Rh-negative individuals amongst their populations. Even Asia, a region with many ancient cultures and different genetic profiles, didn't have the Rh-negative factor. It was mostly found in one continent, Europe, where it not only showed up, but it actually grew quickly. Our current understanding of human evolution suggests that all of us have a common ancestor from Africa's southern or sub-Saharan regions. Now that shared lineage suggests that our early and human ancestors were all Rh positive, and the Rh negative factor was not present in them. So that raises an interesting question. Where did we get this mutagen in the first place? George Newry, an important figure in this field, talked about this very puzzle. He says, when we look at the entire human population, only 15% are Rh negative. Just 15%. Now that leaves researchers scratching their heads as they try to figure out where it came from. Theories are plenty. If you have this unique Rh negative trait, could it mean that you evolved from different species entirely? Is this a sign of a species created artificially, a result of advanced genetic modification techniques, or, or, or could it just be a natural result of evolution in response to Earth changing conditions? The answer is still unknown. Nuri also wonders about the possibility that the 15% of the population that is Rh negative might come from a different origin from the rest. He suggests a fascinating idea. Could these Rh negative individuals who make up a significant amount of our population have come from somewhere else? Not from our own ancestral lineage, but from a different, maybe perhaps extraterrestrial source? The Rh negative trait has confused scientists and fascinated thinkers for a long time now. Its origins, implications, and importance are still shrouded in mystery. But it's this puzzle that keeps us driven to find out more. It challenges our understanding of human evolution, genetics, our own identity. It serves as a constant reminder of our intricate and complex biological diversity. So, what's your take on this captivating mystery? Do you think that Rh-negative people could be from a different lineage? Or do you think they're from an alien? Do you think they're alien babies? Aliens. Leave your thoughts in the comment section down below, hit that like button, and subscribe for more fascinating explorations into our world's enigmas. Bye.